So Klages, Ludwig Klages, is a philosopher whose work deplores the destruction of nature. I think that is the center of his philosophy, de de deplores the, the, the destruction of nature. He deplores the collapse of life and vitality, both in the exterior world, the visible world, uh, the, 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 role of, the, the role of technology in this world, which just destroys nature, the immediacy, but also in the inside world, human nature. It's also destroyed, uh, and we will see more in detail in what way it is destroyed. So that is some kind of uh, omen under which this philosophy is, is put. And Clarkes believes that what we call civilization is in fact hostile to life. It, it runs counter to life, and the problem is that this hostility of civilization towards life has been accepted by many people as something normal. It's, it's hardly even questioned anymore. So this destruction of life isn't even seen as a destruction of life, it has been normalized as, as, it's something, as, as though it were evident or obvious, something that we could take as a starting point rather than that we put it into question. So what Clarkes wants to do is to develop a philosophy which tries to not continue to de-realize things, tries to not suffocate things, but that tries to reanimate things so that we can have a true encounter with them. That's interesting. He tries to, to revivify nature. And nature is not just the animate nature, but everything, even the stone. And the stone and the mountain and the sun and the stars. It's, it all belongs to life. And he wants to prepare us for a, a real, a renewed encounter with it, an exchange with it, rather than have them objectified, reduced to that a thinly status. So his philosophy, he calls it Metaphysique, also Ausdruckswissenschaft, science of expression, or the Erscheinungswissenschaft, science of appearance, phenomenality, true phenomenality, which has not yet been derealized or suffocated, or also symbolisches Denken, a symbolical thinking, a thinking in terms of symbolicity. Science, what we call science, Science derealizes things and it misrepresents perception by doing as if perception and experience were something technical, as though it were a relation between an object and a subject, in which the subject and the object are both previously identified with things, as though the receiving, the experiencing subject were a thing just as well as the experienced object were a thing. Consciousness is not a thing. The neurologists today think it is. They think that consciousness is a matter of brain activity. Of course there is brain activity, but Clarus, preceding the, the, the heyday of co contemporary uh, uh, neurology, that, 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 that pretends to explain thought and consciousness uh, to the bottom, Clarke says no, the, br the brain is not the same as consciousness. It might be an expression of consciousness. Consciousness itself is not a thing. It precedes thingliness of being. So the act of experiencing is not a relation to between two things. It is a kind of immediate awareness of which obje objectifying act is only a result. So what does that imply for philosophy, for thinking? Thinking, philosophy, it cannot be a distract, distracted or distant observation, as though the philosopher could allow him or herself to be at a distance from life and contemplate it from her or his study room and think about life outside, about the world, which is passively waiting for their understanding in the, in the mind of the philosopher, not in the least. 
philosophy is ultimately, and here again I hope to make you enthusiastic as much as I am, philosophy is a reflection which starts in a mantic experience. You know the word mantic, manticism, man a mantic experience. It, ex it consists of an interpretation of structures, connections, events that do not meet the demand of verification, repetitiveness, of being tested. And that is the curse, I think, of what we call science today, the empirical science, which pretends something, that something can only exist or be meaningful once we can test it, once we can repeat it. But it might be so that the most meaningful experiences there are are not repeatable. They are beyond repetition. Well, what, what kind of experience? Well, the example of, of, of synchronicity experiences. Well, you can have them, but you cannot repeat them, you cannot reproduce them. You must simply passively wait whether or not it takes place in your life. But you cannot manipulate them. Or any singular coincidences. For example, this meeting here, which for me at least is exceptional. I never had such a conference where I smelled drugs during my presentation, which is very fascinating. I already announced this on Facebook. I'm attending a conference where I sm <laughs> smell drugs. Uh, so this is very singular in a way. But the singularity itself might be very meaningful without being reproducible. Still meaningful. And also, the experience of, of ecstasy or contemplation, uh, of feeling the feeling of oneness with the cosmos or with your love partner or with the tree you're admiring or the mountain or whatever, uh, to, to vibrate, to co vibrate with life. That experience, which not everybody may be familiar with, but you might be familiar with it now and then, or perhaps frequently, it depends upon, upon your personality, I think to co-vibrate with the rhythm of nature. That is and should be the source of philosophy or religion or mysticism, whatever you, you think is meaningful. That is Clarkes' philosophy, ecstasy, visionary powers, etc. That is and should be the starting point of philosophy. Now, let me <coughs> quote one uh, remark. Um, I, I don't know, do you all understand German? Not everybody, perhaps. I, I, I can try to quote. So, in the following quote, Clark has suggested, ecstasy is not in itself visionary, but precedes it. So the ecstatic experience, which is supposedly the basis of philosophy, might prepare for vision, but is not identical to it. Das dicht die Ekstase an und für sich schon seherisch ist, in ihrer Vollendung am ehesten ähnlich der Selbstvergessenheit des vollkommenen Glückberauschten führt sie vorübergehend zum Erlöschen des Bewusstseins überhaupt in eine Brandung von Grund aus aufgewühlter Lebenswogen, den Ergriffenen mit einem Bildermeer überflutend, das in jeder Besinnung darauf beraubt. So this is the style of Klages, lengthy sentences, they're full of vibration, they're very orgastic, I would even call them. So the ecstasy itself is not already visionary, but they, the ecstatic experience can be compared to the, uh, the, to the self, loss of self, forgetfulness of self, while being completely swept away by <coughs> happiness, well the word happiness English word is it's, it's not the same as Gluck. <laughs> happiness sounds too much utilitarian. I don't know utilitarian. Well, everybody is striving for happiness, and what we should do is to, to enlarge the number of, of happy, happiness in this world. That's utilitarian, the miserable, meager, shallow, utilitarian account of ethics. Uh, you may be familiar with it or, uh, directly or indirectly. So Gluck is something different. So Gluck is something that sweeps, sweeps, sweeps you away. It's, 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 Sweeps you away. Yeah, that takes you with you. Takes you with you, and that brings you to kind of of ecstasy, of 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 illusion, of 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 what's illusion, of, of extinction of consciousness. It's beyond consciousness, as though you were in a sea. And the brandung was brandung, the the rolling. Of the 
the way the waves of the yeah, but I mean, they went close to the shore. The, the, tide? the tide, the current, yeah. This is where, where you, tide, yeah. yeah. It's very. If you're standing in it, you feel the stones uh, uh, hitting your your legs, and that that feeling, that is life itself. That life experience cannot be rationally accounted for. It's beyond that. When we use rationality, we can do two things. Either we can account for it. We can. It, our rational argument can be. <coughs> an attempt to do justice to that experience, and that is how Clarges wants to interpret his own thinking, and many true philosophers are doing the same, but what's mostly the case with people who seem to be rational, seem to argue for their point of view, in fact, they have nothing to say. They don't, they only have the means, but they don't have a source. They can argue, but they don't have a source which inspires them. Well, they may have a non-source as their source, a pure nihilism. And I think that this applies to the majority of politicians today, and also to a lot of people who call themselves philosophers at the university. They can argue, they can refute your argument, you can show that, that you are wrong because you're inconsistent, but that's the only thing that they can do. For the rest, they're empty. Just check your own teachers that you have had. Well, you may have had the, good, the inspiring ones, the ones that, that you still remember, and also the ones that, uh, that can be very sharp arguing, but are in themselves empty, because they are not situating themselves in life experience. So it is only, according to Clark, it's only the extinction of will that can bring new insights, the extinction of will. So will, we already hear this idea that will itself is may not be equal to what is really at stake. The laws of nature, praised or taken as a starting point by what we call science, something that you cannot countervene, is not even equal to necessity, as opposed to what scientists claim. Something is necessary if it, if it follows, if it, if it obeys the laws of nature, the eternal rules of nature. But in fact, what we call law of nature might very well be something else, might be the imposition of an inner logic, an attempt, a desperate attempt, to equalize, to assimilate, to identify onto nature. Whereas necessity does not even exclude singularity. <coughs> So it may be so that some experience which is completely idiosyncratic, completely unique, completely singular, may still be experienced as necessary without obeying the laws of nature, even by not obeying the laws of nature. So what Clarkes wants to do is to, to disentangle necessity and laws of nature, implying what, that what we call the laws of nature, what, whatever, the law of gravity, the law of... of uh, what, what else do you have the, of, of, of the conservation of energy, etc.? Those laws do not say anything about nature itself. They're only an attempt to domesticate nature. That's a very provocative thesis that Clarkes has. It requires some explanation, but okay, we cannot do everything. Okay. <laughs> now, let me come to the, the title of the book, which in a way summarizes Clarkes' entire philosophy, Der Geist. Als Widersacher der Seele, the spirit as the adversary of the soul. So this is Clarkes' philosophy. It's a kind of dualism. There are two principles: the principle which he calls Geist, spirit, and the principle of soul. Well, to make things easy, I could say that spirit is the negative one and soul is the positive one. So let's start with describing this spirit. That's again, as Clark as terms, we might may be inclined to you to, to our, ourselves be inclined to give a positive meaning to the word spirit, but for Clark is negative. The will, the spirit is reason, it's rationality. It is will. So there he criticizes Nietzsche. So that is something negative. Will, intelligence, intelligence that is a reason that is spirit. And what is characteristic of that? It, it is not characteristic of reason that it is rational, but what is characteristic of reason 
rationality, of will, that it interrupts. It interrupts the flow of life. Das Wollen hat biologisch zur Voraussetzung das Dasein eines Hemmenden im Strom der Seele. So the willing has as its presupposition the existence of something which is inhibitive. So I just quote some other kind of definitions. So what is, what is spirit? And, and it's, it's a very phenomenological, very concrete, very direct explanation. I think you're all familiar with this. So this spirit is anhalten müssen. Oder hinaustreten aus dem Erlebnisstrom. To be, to be kicked out of the flux of life. Ein plötzlich sich daneben befinden, zufolge einen blitzartig stattgehabten Stoß. So, so it is as though your just original position is within life. You're flowing with life, experiencing life, you're undergoing it, but suddenly you're swept away, you're, you're kicked out of it. And you find yourself beside life. And that's what rationality is. Rationality is an attempt to, to extract you from life and impose its laws onto life. Spirit is, in another term, ein Störungserlebnis. The experience of a disturbance. Just one example, if you're watching television, well, we shouldn't perhaps do that. Well, okay, take a movie and you're enjoying it, you love it, and suddenly the device refuses, so you have a disturbance. Well, that's very annoying. Can you imagine? It's annoying. That is the effect of will or rationality or the spirit. And still another description of the spirit that may again surprise us and perhaps be even provocative. Spirit is Ich-Tätigkeit, activity of the ego. That's spirit. Now, spirit itself cannot be directly accessed. Why not? Because spirit is parasitical. The spirit itself, rationality or will, cannot do anything without the soul. Because there must be something that is interrupted. So Plagas, as a philosopher of life, thinks life to be the ultimate mysterious reality, and spirit is an enigmatic force that comes from nobody can say where from, because then we would be a metaphysician. We cannot, we cannot over, have an overview of the play of life. Uh, being, no, we can only undergo it. And spirit is just a secret enigmatic force that interrupts life. But it cannot do anything on itself. It's completely dependent of life, which it blocks, which it interrupts. It can only be experienced as a frustration, because when you're feeling something, you're involved in something, you're immersed in something, and suddenly, suddenly that experience is blocked, it is disrupted. And that is where spirit makes itself felt. And in fact, this is what, what we call personality comes down to. Our personality, our ego, our I. In fact, our ego is not a natural thing. Our ego is nothing, according to Clark, is nothing but the antagonism between spirit and soul. So what we call the ego, our ego, me, Rico Schneller, my name, is a battlefield of two forces, in a way, of the soul and the spirit. And I call it me, myself. As though that, that was something obvious, something given. I might also call it the subject, the rational subject. I might call it, that's me, that's what I think, what I believe. I'm voting for or against Trump or for or against Angela Merkel. I have this opinion, I have that faith or that belief, or I have that scientific opinion. That ego that is speaking is itself not beyond debate. It is the first problem there is. So that is something which I found so interesting to realize. Uh, so of course I'm not telling you that, that this is the truth, you should believe this, uh, no, just uh, this is kind of an attempt to, to make ourselves think about this, uh, whether or not we are, have access to this inner battlefield, which is described as something problematic. Since something is disturbed, something is finally killed, it is suffocated, life, life experience. 
by a force which is interrupted, inevitable, the spirit. Okay, so that's so much for the spirit. Now the soul, and I think I have slide which yeah, so uh, yeah, so life. So life, soul, the terms they, they belong together. Life, the soul, and again Plagas manages to find very telling metaphors, I think. So he compares the soul to or life to vibration, to waves, the waves of the sea that endlessly go up and down, up and down. It's a kind of original pulsation. So it's again interesting. Life is not defined as an, e as an eternal equilibrium, equilibrium or equanimity or some, some infinite calm. No, life is originally going up and down. It's vibrating, it's vibrating, pulsating, pulsation. And life is also originally experienced. Here again, we have some very interesting point of view, which runs counter the materialist, reductionist accounts of so many contemporary scientists who claim that consciousness is a product of material uh, processes. According to Klages, is not. Because life is always already experienced by the soul. They mutually imply each other, they're mutually implicative. The soul and life are mutually implicative because the soul is the name for that which experiences life. The kind of the mirror of the sea or the lake, surface of a lake, which reflects heaven or the sun or the moon, whatever. They cannot be thought without the other. Okay, so just as I gave some, I tried to give some descriptions of this principle of the spirit, the geist, rationality, will, it interrupts, it blocks, it impedes, inhibits. Let me also give some characteristic of the soul. I have some, given some initial description. It's comparable to pulsation, the waves, shocks. The soul is that which is susceptible of, and I have a very beautiful German word, Stimmung. And the word Stimmung cannot be translated, I think. Well, in, in Dutch we have stemming, of course, but in English it would be something like mood. Stimmung, it has in it the word Stimme, voice, but also Stimme of, of a harpsichord or piano, which ought to be, uh, well, I don't know how to say that in English, to, to be, to make a tune, a tune, yeah, a tune, attunement. So Stimmung might be attunement. Uh, what is Stimmung? So soul is, is that which is susceptible of Stimmung. In other words, for eine seelische Klangfarbe. A soul, a soul like coloratura. Do you know coloratura? Like you have, when, when you have listening to music, music yeah, may have this particular coloratura. coloratura, coloratura, coloratura. Do you know that uh, word? Just, now, a kind of, well, something that you cannot reduce to notes, but that is that's something that supervenes upon the music. The, 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 uh, well, you can uh, you can only express it by using metaphors. Like the color of music, like uh, the, uh, you have some uh, the composers. Sometimes they add some some remarks on how to play it. Uh, that, uh, uh, I can perhaps elucidate it by referring to paintings, uh, in which the term color seems to apply much better than in music. Although to Klages it, it applies equally well both in music and in in, in painting or in real life. Um, coloratura may be equated with a hue, the hue, for example, which has been so well captured by Monet, uh, Cézanne. Uh, this is my example, Cézanne. You know, he made a lot of paintings of this very same mountain, La Montagne Sainte Victoire, and he tried each time he tried to ca capture the particular hue, the, the 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 mood. But mood, the English word mood is too subjectivist. It refers too much to experiencing subject. But the mood, according to Klages, is just as well a property of the environment, which is simultaneously experienced by soul. Rather than by the soul, I would say by soul, without the, 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 the um, article. So I think about all impressionist paintings, like the cathedrals by Monet, or the, the Nymphia, you call those, the water lilies, uh, those. And each time the painter tries to capture that, the subtlety about it, and the, the subtlety of something, <coughs> the coloratura of music, the subtlety of it, which extends or exceeds just simply the notes. 
And you can also think about when you read literature. Uh, literature may also be characterized by a certain rachu. Well, again, you can say that's a kind of that's a metaphor. But for Clarks, there are no metaphors. Eh? They apply equally both in painting and in music and in reading and, and in thinking even. Thinking may also be tainted by a hue, by a certain atmosphere. For example, when Heidegger and perhaps German thinkers as such are ex frequently experienced by non-Germans, by Americans or English or Dutch as heavy thinkers or with the or like Heidegger, he's never smiling, he's always very earnest, very, very, very melancholic. So that is a you. Do you can you follow that? The you, the subtlety of so that is what is what's the soul is capable of, of experiencing, of receiving the hue, the subtlety, the colorature of a, of a, of, a, of a book, of a painting, of I mean, everything which is experienced. Um, the soul is, is, is also that by means of which life makes itself felt. So life is experienced by the soul. And life, again, is not the biology. That's what the scientists claim. Life is biological and one day perhaps we can unriddle the secrets of life and perhaps even we can produce life. And may there be life on Mars or whichever planet? Well, those questions are death-born from the outset. They're vain, they're empty. Because those questions pretend uh, about whether or not there will be life, uh, can we, whether or not we can recreate life or, or find life on another planet. These questions, they, they cannot even explain life. They're completely ignorant of life. They do as if life were an object that we can explain from the outside, but it cannot. Life implies from the onset it's being experienced, it being received, it being imbibed or something, I have to say this. So, and life again, life as such, is not a state of affairs, stable, immobile. Life is originally a, 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 a set of original resemblances, images. So Clarkes' ontology does not consist of a great number of things that somehow exist one after one. No, the basis, there is an original concordance of similarities, images. And what we call things, objects, whether it is a chair or a computer or a person or a sun or a star or a god, whatever, those things, those objects, they're always too late because they presuppose a primordial state of the original resemblances. Well, and I was reminded of this with the previous speaker. You spoke about uh, when the, the drugs experience. Uh, perhaps you can elucidate that later, what you were hinting at. That also, at least following you, also seems to presuppose an original resemblance uh, which make one, by experiencing it, make one capable of, of, a set of, of first assessing things, of, of, of being sensitive to what is coming up. So it's very strange, Clagas was very, uh, well, some might call, call it superstitious, but he had some belief in what the ancients were capable of, 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 of announcing things to come, but simply by um, witnessing the I've got the bowels of, of birds, for example, or the bowels of 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 of, of, uh, of, of animals that had been slaughtered. Uh, today we say, oh, that is uh, uh, stupid, uh, superstitious, it's it's just crazy, and of course, the, but this critique is just as stupid, perhaps, as this ancient ancient practice was, because it is blind to the presuppositions of that ancient practice of reading the the, the future in the bowels of a slaughtered animal because it obeys to completely different logic. The logic, which is also Clagasis, which implies that there is an original belonging together of things, a kind of a, a mutual assignment of things to each other. And the word things is always already artificial. There are no things. Things are constructions. Okay, so I tried to explain this. It's very difficult because we tend to think in terms of things. 
another characteristic of the soul is that it is oriented on something that we somehow lost. The notion of a goal. If you know something about modern science and its critique of the ancient Aristotelianism, what it did was show that Aristotle's idea that everything is characterized by an intrinsic goal which it tries to achieve in its own span of life, or that that was a uh, kind of uh, superstitious or speculative idea. That's how modern science arose, by eradicating the idea of inborn finality of nature. But Clark somehow seems to reintroduce that by suggesting that the soul is the susceptibility of an inborn finality, or teleology. And finally applied to the body, me here, or you, the body of man. The body is not a body. The body is not an object, let alone an object which is endowed with the spirit, which is the metaphysical or transcendent body. No, the body has as its essential characteristic to be an expression. An expression of what? An expression of the soul. The body an expression of the soul. Now I like this thought so much because I think you're all familiar with the experience of having a meeting. I had a meeting with you uh, and, uh, and well several others and immediately I feel you are wonderful people but we didn't, we hardly share any words together and ducks, where is ducks? Yeah, I really felt you're a wonderful person. Uh, we, we hardly know each other, but that's uh, okay. If I try to translate that in like legacy terms, I may be wrong. Of course, I do not know, but I think. I, I, well, I do really think. I feel. Uh, so, Clara suggests that the body is only an expression. It's not a container of something spiritual. It is an expression of something soul-like. It's of soul, and which can be explained by referring to that which is experienced on a body of someone. Uh, if you, can, if you, you fall in love with someone, or you feel attracted with someone, or feel uh, repelled by someone, if you feel disgusted by someone, uh, it may be so that that body <coughs> lets or does not let permeate through it soul. So some quotes. Um, so, die Seele ist durch und durch pathisch. The soul is, is pathic through and through. Pathic means it is undergoing. Pathos in Greek, to undergo, to, to suffer, but it's already a negative connotation. It, the, the soul is that which undergoes. Which doesn't, the soul doesn't argue. The soul simply feels. The soul simply senses. The soul simply accesses, intuits. Die, die Seele, sie bewege, sofern sie bewegbar sei, sie bewege aus Erleidnis und niemals aus Tatkraft. The soul doesn't move out of activity, of force of act, of uh, Tatkraft, sondern aus Erleidnis. And this word cannot be translated, it doesn't even exist in German. Uh, uh, the soul moves by being moved. In, in all senses of the word move, I'm moved. I'm moved by the story, I'm moved by the, by the movie, I'm, movie. <laughs> I'm moved by the movie. And by the way, the movie moves me. Yeah, and that is so. If you start thinking about it, reflecting upon it, that is Tatkraft, that's not so anymore. Sie sei nicht von sich aus tätig gemacht. It's not from itself active. <coughs> the soul simply gives in, yields or complies, <coughs> surrenders in a way. Ma Coming to a close because I want to give you some uh, time to react on this. Uh, I'll be very brief because you may forget a lot of things. What again? What we call the ego, the I, is not something obvious. My character, my unique individuality, my political views, my religious views, my scientific viewpoints. No, the ego is only and you stand there the first him one. Wonderful definition. A system of inhibitions of feeling. So realize this. Whenever you present yourself to someone else, uh, I am Rico Schneller, I am Dax Le De Franco. Uh, who is that Dax? Uh, well, who is Sarah? Well, <laughs> the system of Kafulsemon, a system of inhibition of feelings. Though the implication is, of course, that we should give in to feelings and not intervene by 
appropriating by not by identifying us with certain images which are always artificial, always always uh, uh, always uh, uh, constructed. They don't come back to something real. Okay. Now the final remark I'd like to make. It is on so the, we have heard that the spirit operates upon the soul by inhibiting it by disrupting it, by destroying it ultimately, by sucking it empty, like a, how do you call it, a blood sucker? Blood sucker, do you call it? Leech. A, be, a leech. leech, a leech, yeah, a leech, a leech. It, it, uh, so uh, we experience this by, uh, I don't know what your or your age is, but I, I'm, I'm sure that several of uh, you already had that first burnout, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I don't ask you personally. Uh, so, burnout, or, well, uh, maybe you can't. <laughs> try to prevent it, but I think several of you have had a spiritual crisis. It may be due to the fact of some imposed spirit, be it in the form of some rational construction or a belief system or a science or some ideology or work ideology, sucks you empty. That's what we call burnout. And then we go to do yoga, and then and maybe even paid by our employer, so that we can be re-employed as soon as possible. Okay, so rather than that, we conclude that we might change our life. Okay, now to end optimistically, it is not only the spirit that operates upon the soul by destroying it, but sometimes we see another operation from the soul upon the spirit. So what may happen is that that construct built by the spirit collapses and that soul pierces through that it starts to flow again if that happens then we may experience ecstasy vision mystical experience that's where religions are born that's where new creative ideas are born they are born out of a collapse out of a rupture out of a implosion. So, I quote, Wenn die Begeisterung das Wissen befruchtet, so entstehen nach dem Glauben aller Zeiten und Völker Offenbarung, Erleuchtung, Eingebung, Inspiration. So, once the enthusiasm fertilizes knowledge or knowing, then, according to the belief of all times, of times immemorial, what arises is revelation, illumination, inspiration. And this is something to end with, which I, I'm convinced of myself. <laughs> I'm desperately <coughs> awaiting this moment. I cannot always produce it, I can only my, prepare myself to it. And I noticed we had a talk before this meeting during the dinner, and I said, I'm, I'm, I noticed that I'm very different. Uh, when I teach from when I'm just outside teaching in an average, everyday conversation uh, when I teach sometimes I feel lifted like by eagles wings uh, where does it come from? I don't know it just it just happens and then ordinary life returns and just as uh, basic as everybody so that experience and uh, well I cannot produce it I can only open myself to it but that is what what fills me with energy in which which I believe may be, may be inspiring to other people because I believe that there are inspiring things to be transmitted to other to young people especially because if teaching comes down to instilling your own cynicism to people <laughs> sorry for being rude now then you do not deserve living. Sorry to say this. I, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. You do, I think I agree with myself now. You do, so if you're doing that, stop it, please. Uh, get out of the university. Get out of the, polit of the parliament because you're spoiling generations. And especially with young people who, are, who can be, yeah, can be molded in all kinds of directions. And if you, if you Im imbibe them with your pessimism, with your reductionism, yeah. These people are entering societies. They become the leaders of new societies. And if they are negativist, pessimistic, reductionist, sarcastic, so they will destroy the society. They will be the future leaders. So this is a crime against humanity. I'm convinced of that. So that's what I believe, that we must somehow try to, to not have our own egos at the first place. 
especially when teaching or when acting in society, how we must make a place for something or someone else. And we must be uh, a passage for that. That's what I believe. Okay, thank you very much.